check out this book. I've been uh, listening to this book for a while. I haven't finished it yet. So I figured I'd go ahead and finish it with you guys. It's called Original Gangster. Gangsters. Gangsters. They got to put the black stars on it. Anyway, this is Original Gangsters. It's a book by Ben Westoff about the history of hip hop in Los Angeles in the West Coast. Hit the thumbs up button. Let's go ahead and get into it. But at the time, Cube didn't feel exploited. In fact, by not signing any paperwork, he unknowingly insulated himself. Mm. I never signed my publishing away, he said. Mm. You turn this dude into a rapper. Dre met a group called HBO, a.k.a. Homeboys Only, who were from New York, but in 1986 were staying for a time in Southern California. Mm. They had a Run DMC vibe, and he agreed to record them. But upon arriving to Lonzo's studio, they didn't stick around for long. Mm. Their main historic claim to fame nowadays is that they passed on the boys in the hood. <laughs> they was like, yo, man, we ain't doing that song. That's a West Coast record, Dre said. They was like, what are you talking about? What's a 6-4? Mm -hmm. Cube said. Having already booked the studio time, Dre and Eric weren't sure what to do. Dre suggested Eric rap the song. He'd memorized Cube's version, after all, and the song was more like his life than anyone else's. Mm. He was already a street cat, so why not play one on record? Right. But Eric was timid. Put your glasses on. Cut the lights down, said Dre, motioning to Eric's sunglasses. Just do it. Eric gave it a go, but he clearly didn't know what he was doing. His delivery was clunky, his cadence and timing a disaster. <laughs> but Dre was patient, taking the time to punch in each line. He'd have Eric rap a short bit, cruising down the street in my six foe, rewind the tape, perform it again, and then stitch together the best takes. <laughs> it took eight or nine hours, but was worth the wait. Dre's genius was recognizing that for all his faults, Eric had the goods to be a memorable rapper, a unique voice. Indeed, Eric's squeaky instrument turned out to be both terrifying and calming, foreign and immediately recognizable. I looked at Dre in amazement like, you turned this dude into a rapper, said Cube. Still, Boys wasn't an immediate success. They weren't sure at first how to promote it. Some doubted it would work at all. A rapper who ran in their circles named MC Chip remembers being shocked after hearing it for the first time with all the cursing. You're thinking like, damn, how's he going to get radio play? They would worry about that later. For the time being, now that he was a rapper, Eric needed a rap name. The genesis of the moniker Easy e is a bit unclear, but he started using it around this time. Cube says they conceived it at the studio. It sounded cool. And it really described him. Easy's childhood friend Big A says a pair of music industry brothers, he can't remember their names, gave it to him. He would sit in their office chair and they said, you really take life easy. You're an easy kind of guy, mm -hmm. Big A said. JD from The Lynch Mob speculates Easy may have gotten it from the 1984 song Big Mouth by Houdini, of whom Easy was a fan. The track concerns a rumor that had been spread around town. Pam was overheard talking to her man. Pam told Cookie what she thought she heard, and somehow Easy E had got the word. Whatever the case, on his very first attempt, he'd made rap history. The line, cruising down the street in my 6-4, created gangster rap, said Terrence Punch Henderson the president of the label responsible for Kendrick Lamar. Macola. I was very blue-eyed, Don McMillan said. I trusted everybody. Perhaps that's why in 1986, he welcomed a Compton drug dealer to Macola, his record-pressing plant. The first thing McMillan, then in his 50s, noticed about Easy e three decades his junior, was how short he was. <laughs> then he realized that the room had emptied out. The other artists who were there to talk business had suddenly vanished. 
He's dangerous, someone told him later. Hmm. You don't even want to talk to him, said someone else. This guy will shoot you if he looks at you. Don himself found Easy exceedingly pleasant. Hmm. And in any case, Easy was there on legitimate business. He wanted the boys in the hood pressed up. McMillan was an unlikely hip-hop champion. Born in Victoria, British Columbia, as a young man, he drove a tugboat along the Pacific coast, pulling oil and gas barges to service logging camps and villages. He arrived in Los Angeles in 1960. But by the time Easy e came knocking, he was a white-haired family man who lived in suburban Palos Verdes estates and enjoyed golf. Don had developed ties with the black music community in the 60s and 70s while working at a vinyl pressing plant called Cadet on South Normandy Avenue. The South Central spot made records for artists like Ike and Tina Turner, Etta James, and B.B. King. In 1983, after Cadet folded, Macmillan bought McCola during a fire sale and brought with him some of Cadet's artists and employees. Though mm. compact discs would soon take off, cassettes and vinyl still had a bit more life in them. Macmillan and his employees tended to vinyl presses and shrink wrapping machines in the small bare bones plant on a dodgy stretch of Santa Monica Boulevard in Hollywood that they mm. shared with gangs and male prostitutes. Mm. The cluttered plant had ashtrays strewn about and cardboard boxes everywhere. Records going out, records being returned. Wearing slacks and a collared sports shirt, a cigarette on his lips, Don gave artists a certain amount of time to collect their records that mm. hadn't sold. But if they didn't, beware. That vinyl was headed straight to the grinder to be pressed into something else. Mm. By the mid-80s, McCola was doing great business with self-starting black artists from south of downtown. What made McCola perfect for their needs was that it was a printing plant, record label, and distributor all in one. Why wait for a major record label to discover you when you could get your own professional-looking album on the cheap? A thousand dollars got you 500 records, mm. with Macmillan taking a percentage of sales in exchange for distribution. Looking for a professional photographer for your next big event? Need video of your special day? Then look no further. For $100 an hour have a professional photographer or videographer, shoot your wedding, birthday party, quinceanera bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah, anniversary party or whatever your special occasion may be. Highlight your event with professional, crisp, photos and video. Check out Charles Arnes Photography on Instagram as well as book us for your next event. Must live in the Southern California area. Oh, wow. It was a fair trade. Macmillan had connections with record store supplying distribution networks around the country, including with Memphis-based Selecto Hits, whose co-owner Johnny Phillips' Uncle Sam discovered Elvis. Hmm. And so a rapper could bring in his music one day and quite possibly have a hit on his hands soon after. Hmm. McCola was an open-door policy, said McCola promoter Ray Kennedy. A lot of people were coming in who normally wouldn't get a chance. Hmm. Macmillan's somewhat ad hoc business model hit pay dirt with Greg Broussard, a.k.a. DJ Egyptian Lover, mm -hmm. a breakout star from Uncle Jam's Army, the popular L.A. DJ crew who already had their own McCola vinyl, Dial a Freak. Broussard came in to press up his robotic 12-inch 1984 record, Egypt, Egypt, and return for 500 more copies, and then 500 more. Oh, wow, he, was he was selling them himself, out mm -hmm. of his car's trunk, at swap meets, wherever, and Don asked to get in on the action, seeding the work through his distribution channels. For Egyptian Lover's full-length On the Nile album shoot, Macmillan costumed Broussard and rented the necessary Egyptian memorabilia, according to a news account, which is hilarious to imagine. Macmillan soon took his entrepreneurship to the next level by signing two live crew, then a Riverside, California-based trio of Air Force Reserve men riding the Electro Wave. Their McCola single, The Revelation, Too Live, gained popularity in South Florida, and so at the invitation of a DJ named Lou Campbell, they performed in Miami and eventually moved there. After Campbell joined the group himself and no, no. raunchily recast their image, they broke nationally, going on to define the Southern rap sound 
and soundtrack countless hot tub parties. McCullough eventually released records from a who's who of important California artists, including MC Hammer, Too Short, Ice-T, and Digital Underground. Their R&B electro group, Timex Social Club, broke into Billboard's top ten with their song, Rumors. The whole time, McMillan didn't know the L.A. hip-hop scene from Adam. He couldn't tell a good record from a bad record, <laughs> at least as far as rap goes, said McMillan's lawyer, Gerald Weiner. His talent was timing, and he was smart enough to let his distributors and vendors tell him what to push. Still, some found his business dealing shady. Egyptian lover, Arabian prince, Roger Clayton and others accused him of bootlegging albums, printing up extra copies, selling them secretly, and of then course. keeping the proceeds for himself. Mm -hmm. I would imagine Don was selling records out the back door, said Chuck Fassard, marketing and sales manager at McCola. A number of McMillan's associates added that he had ties with a nefarious crew back east who helped promote world-class wrecking crew's hit, Turn Off the Lights. The crew's Lonzo Williams described getting a call from a man with a New York accent who accused him of improperly licensing Turn Off the Lights. He said, if you were in New York, they'd find you in the Hudson River. Mm. McMillan denied all impropriety and any associations with intimidations. The idea that Don somehow didn't treat people fairly, it's just BS in my opinion, said his lawyer Gerald Weiner, adding, I will say that I think his accounting department was abysmal. I think if you asked Don at any one moment how many records he'd sold, he wouldn't know. Anyway, shady, shady, shady music business, man. Anyway, we're going to get more into original gangsters uh, and then some more episodes. Uh, but if you guys want to go ahead and check it out yourself and, and uh, listen ahead, you can go ahead and go to Audible and purchase original gangsters. Uh, ben Westoff, they got it on Spotify. It's on Spotify as well. If y'all want to check them out, it's a really good book. Dr. Dre just got a star on a, uh, he just got a star. Dr. Dre just got a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. It's funny because I could have swore he got one five years ago, but that was Ice Cube, I believe. Ice Cube and Snoop got one, and Dre just not getting here. I could have swore, I could have swore Dre got his um, a long time ago, but I think that might have been N.W.A. That might have been N.W.A. getting a star. I don't think Dre got one. Uh, or it might have been Easy E got a star. Maybe he got one. I don't know. But I could have swore Dre already got one. That had to be for NWA, I'm thinking, when the movie first came out. Because they always get those stars around the time they got something to promote or something like that. You know, which I didn't realize that you can actually buy a star. You just got to be associated with something in film music and television and you can actually buy a star which i didn't know that i thought you had to earn it but america everything's for sale in america anyway what do y'all think about this video leave your comments and subscribe to charles and as well appreciate it